the ancient city of York. Today it is the historic jewel in Yorkshire's crown. Its narrow streets and medieval buildings have survived countless battles and bloody encounters. By the time World War erupted, York's troubled past seemed comfortably confined to history. Back in 1942, three years of war seemed to have barely touched the city. Like everywhere else in the country, York had undergone changes. At first, the threat from the air seemed very real. A wave of Anderson shelters had gone up around the city, and York had an impressive number of public shelters built. But York seemed destined to escape the destruction inflicted on other northern cities like Sheffield and Hull. By early 1942, almost 800 air raid warnings had sent York citizens racing to their shelters, but only on a handful of occasions had any bombs actually fallen. No one believed the Germans were really interested in York. People like Edna Blakeborough, who lived on Nunthorpe Grove with her husband and three-year-old daughter Anne, were becoming complacent. We did sit through many nights of sitting up when there was a siren and waiting for it to go in. And the thing was, it went so often that you thought, well, I'm not going to lose my sleep. I'm not getting up. And you didn't. We were lulled, weren't we? But Hitler had Britain's beautiful cathedral cities in his sights. On the 24th of April, 1942, the Luftwaffe attacked Exeter. Bath and Norwich were hit the following night. On April the 29th, it was York's turn. We flew in the night. Everything was perfect. The engines were humming. It was a wonderful, clear night. We couldn't see the individual houses, but we could see the flames everywhere. We could see the outline of the city and the area where we were supposed to drop our bombs. A young police constable, Charles Barnard, was on duty that night. And I remember standing outside at a quarter to two time. The flesh started dropping over Clifton. And I thought, well, it looks as though we're going to have a busy night, but I didn't, you know, anticipate exactly what would happen. A wave of bombers began to unload their deadly cargoes over the city, but it would be another 10 minutes before the air raid siren sounded. At Nunthorpe Grove, Edna Blakeborough was at home alone with her daughter, Anne. Well, I was fast asleep, and you can't miss it. It was the first bombs that dropped. It was a terrific sound. No one could ever lay in bed, you know, you just knew. They were just falling all about us. It was, it was terrific, and we were petrified. Despite the danger, Edna left the house with Anne to seek shelter next door. This aircraft came right low, and he was so low, I could see the rear gunner's face. He was in his leather, all his uniform. It was ever so plain. He was only a young man, 19 to 21, I would think. And he was machine gunning me. I think in my mind was if I kept going, he couldn't uh, get me with a machine gun bullet. 13-year-old Brenda Milner was at home with her mother. Her father, William, a qualified first aider, was on the night shift at York Station. Well, the first I remember uh, was my mother shouting and the air raid siren was wailing uh, and the bombs were dropping and my mother was saying, come on, they're here. So my mother and I sat under the dining room table with the budgie in his cage and we could hear the bombs for an hour and a half. 253 Squadron were one of the few RAF night fighter units within reach of York. They were scrambled from Hibblestow in Lincolnshire 20 minutes after the raid began and knew they were in for a difficult night. If you hadn't got radar uh, on the aeroplane, then it was practically impossible. On a really dark night, you haven't much chance of seeing anything unless you just happen to bump into it, as it were. The hurricanes took off and uh, circled the town. Twelve of them 
all the different levels. Once the fires were going, it was not difficult to see the aircraft below you, and they had permission to shoot down any twin-engine aeroplane. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Carl Merlin was nearing his target. Then said he to me the lookout told me when I should drop the bombs. He just shouted, now, and I pressed the button. Then, I think there were four 250 kilo bombs which fell on York in the direction of the industrial quarter. The Bar Convent in York was a Roman Catholic school for girls run by nuns. The school had put air raid protection in place but the attack still came as a shock. There were six nuns who were actually air raid wardens, and so, of course, they stayed above ground uh, with their helmets on, and the rest of the community and the children went into the cellars. Sixty years after they last met, these former pupils recall how the school's well-laid plans were put smoothly into action. I didn't realise there was a raid on it in York, and down we went to the cellars and put the mattresses down, um, said the rosary. But one of the elderly nuns was missing. One of the sisters sent to find her later recounted what happened next. Mother Agnes went out along the passage to get something. Suddenly she gave a scream, I shall remember until I die. It was so agonising. I told her to flash the torch and I went along and found myself at the edge of a hole and Mother Agnes lying below on the laundry floor. Above was a hole in the roof and I could see a dive bomber shooting up again into a sky lit up by flames from the station. She called out to the others that there was a hole, keep away. And they said, oh, we'll fetch a ladder and get you out. And she said, this was the terrible part, she said, no, keep away, I've broken my leg and I'm sitting on a bomb, I can hear it ticking. So they said, no, of course we, we'll, we'll get you out. But as they went, the bomb exploded and killed everybody except the youngest. A blinding dust filled our mouths and eyes and a terrible noise of falling bricks followed it. It was pitch dark and the smell of gas filled the cellar. Rubble from the blast blocked the escape routes from the girls' cellars. The blackness, that's what petrified me. I couldn't bear the blackness and then wondering what was going to happen. And, and then see, people seemed to come quite quickly. An entire east wing of the convent had been destroyed. They all met together and then they realised, of course, that some were missing. And then I suppose Sister Andrew told them what had happened. And I suppose that was the really dreadful moment. From his post in Aikham, Charles Barnard set out to help the rescue operation. Nearby, on Lavender Grove, he found all the houses along one side of the street were destroyed. There were people trapped under the debris. We dug our way through some stuff and lots of people were saying, well, it there must be dead. And we said, well, we'll see what we can find out. And so I'm touches and got through to the doings, to the Morrison shelter. And they were still there. And on, of course, they were unhurt, but they were, you know, in shock. These people talk about trauma. Well, they don't know what trauma is, some of them, when they talk about trauma. If you'd seen some of these people after the raid, they were wandering about in the streets, wondering what had happened, you know. The indoor Morrison shelters were to save many lives that night, remaining intact amid the rubble of the bomb sites. Across the city, fires from incendiary bombs began to take hold. The city's civil defences were struggling valiantly to cope. Over 3,000 homes were damaged in the raid. The injured were flooding the first aid posts. Rescue and fire services were hampered when York's water supplies failed. The main control centre was bombed out and all phone lines went dead, leaving messengers on push bikes as the only means of coordinating operations. 
York's water supplies failed. The main control center was bombed out and all phone lines went dead, leaving messengers on push bikes as the only means of coordinating operations. At Nunthorpe Grove, Edna Blakeborough sheltered at a neighbor's house. We were all sat there except Dorothy. Now she was the ATS girl. Anyway, she said, come upstairs, Edna, don't be so frightened, and see York's burning. And I didn't move. And it was then that we saw the, what we, was blackout move, and the light was swinging. The middle of the, just swinging like that. That was when the explosive must have gone off, the bomb must have gone off, because I don't remember any more. The house received a direct hit from a high explosive bomb. Edna and her neighbors were buried under the rubble. Above them, 253 Squadron's night fighters were homing in on their target. You would creep up behind them. If you could just get underneath them and then come up just slightly below them so they didn't see you and go as close as you dare and then open up. I always tried to hit the gunner first and then come up closer, but uh, you know. You don't know. <laughs> Lieutenant Merlin's crew had completed their mission and were heading for home. While I was still climbing, there was a, a loud noise in the cabin. I knew immediately that a night fighter was shooting at us. I was angry with my comrades. They had not seen the fighter. It must have come from behind. I felt angry, which was not really the best reaction when we were fighting for our lives. He was forced to make an emergency landing. I saw the nose going through the field. We slid through the earth for about 500 meters, taking bushes and branches with us. I was plowing a real English field. Everything was burning. I threw myself out of the plane and dropped to the ground. My nerves were shot to pieces, but I was determined to survive. I ran from the plane. Behind me, the ammunition on the plane was exploding. I didn't know if my own plane was going to shoot me dead. The radio operator had been sitting next to the fuel tanks. He'd been sprayed with fuel and he was burning. I went to him and put my arms around him to put out the flames. His leather helmet had shrunk onto his head. I ripped it off and then saw his belt, which was glowing. I got it off, but it was so hot it burnt my hands. I led him away, but his upper body was completely black. He knew he was going to die from these burns. Buried under the rubble of Nunthorpe Grove, Edna Blakeborough regained consciousness. I really didn't know that I was uh, buried. And I didn't know that Anne was with me. But I heard this voice say to me, for God's sake, don't move. You'll go to the bottom of the crater. Well, I couldn't have moved, I don't think. And they formed a human chain, they told me. They'd seen my little daughter's hand sticking out. We may never have been found. And he said, there's a child's hand there. And we were pulled out of the rubble halfway down that crater. Edna's ATS friend, Dorothy, was not so fortunate. She was found among water. The water had got in. And she was covered, they told me afterwards, she was covered in mud and water. But it, the soldiers came and they dug for 10 days until they found her. In just 90 minutes, the Luftwaffe had done its work. The city's ancient guild hall was ablaze. Large sections of the station were destroyed. The 1015 Express from King's Cross to Edinburgh, loaded with passengers, was hit. William Milner helped the injured into the shelters as the bombs rained down. He went back into a, a building where he worked for his first aid box, and uh, an incendiary bomb fell on the building, and it caught fire, and he was trapped then. 
uh, when his body was found, they said he had the uh, first aid box underneath him. And he'd managed to reach it, but didn't get out. With one of his crew dead and the others badly injured, Lieutenant Carl Merlin went for help and encountered a jumpy home guard. Hörte ich dann ein aufgeregtes Geschrei, hands up, hands up. I heard shouting, hands up, hands up. I put my hands up even though I didn't want to, but I realized they were very agitated. I told them I had no weapons and they checked me over and led me to a Nissan hut. They were very friendly and we chatted. It was the first time in my life that I talked to English people. They were very polite and reasonable, totally normal. There were no expressions of hatred at all. There must have been people there who hated me even though they didn't know me because I was German. But I didn't feel hatred for anyone either. The following day, questions began to be asked in York. The air raid sirens had sounded a full 10 minutes after the raid began. Why had the radar not spotted the approaching bombers earlier and given York's people a chance to take shelter? They'd actually fly up the North Sea um, and then turn. Um, and even then, and this is one of the problems with York, um, all that you know is they're heading over the coast in your general direction. By 1942, it had been realized that you wasted an awful lot of time if you did the air raid siren in the whole area in which the Germans might be attacking. Um, and therefore you didn't turn the sirens on for anywhere, particularly in the northeast, almost until the bombs started to fall. The attacks on Britain's cathedral cities became known as the Baidecker raids after the famous German tourist guidebooks. Legend has it, Hitler ordered the destruction of every historic town which rated three stars or more. But the pattern, though, was picked up too late, and a series of errors meant the York bombers weren't spotted until they crossed the coast. The British had also learnt how to intercept the German radio beams, which fastened over targets. Um, but even in this, they got it wrong for the Baidecker raids. The Germans were now using an extra ultrasonic um, level, uh, um, and the British listening machines were not calibrated to pick these up. York, though, was much more of a military target than many realized. The famous Roundtree's chocolate factory was making munitions. Over 900 workers labored day and night to produce fuses and landmines. Thousands of troops on the move passed through York Station, also a crucial junction in the transport of supplies out to Hull, and from there on to the Eastern Front. It's an extremely important railway, and York was an important point on that railway because there are so many railway lines coming together. Uh, in the Second World War, there was also a big engine shed here which provided the steam locomotives for uh, all of these trains, and that would have been a legitimate target as well. So there's no doubt in my mind that uh, in terms of the rules of engagement during the Second World War, York was a target as far as the railway was concerned. These reconnaissance reports, found and translated after the war, show just how much the Germans knew about York. They give detailed instructions on how to find and attack the station from the air and what sort of defences to expect. The Germans had no use for them, though, until in February 1942, Sir Arthur Bomber Harris was brought in to head up Britain's Bomber Command, an appointment that would have a direct impact on York. Harris wanted to strike at the heart of the German war machine. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Heslington Hall on the outskirts of York was the headquarters of Four Group Bomber Command and would play a vital role in this new emphasis on bombing attacks. There is a sense that the only way the British could strike back at Hitler at the time was by bombing Germany and that there was nothing else that they were really capable of doing at the time. It would be a number of years before they were able to invade Germany, invade France and the Russians were desperately asking us to make a major contribution to the war. Britain was in a desperate fighting situation in 1942. Having been pushed out of Europe, it was only in North Africa that it was engaging the Germans. 
Britain was in a desperate fighting situation in 1942. Having been pushed out of Europe, it was only in North Africa that it was engaging the Germans. From now decaying old airfields around York, four group bomber command would launch a series of devastating attacks on Germany. Primitive navigational devices had meant accurate bombing of specific military targets was almost impossible. So Bomber Harris ordered his forces to focus on industrial centers within cities. It was a sea change in strategy known as area bombing. To test the new strategy, Harris chose the historic port of Lübeck as a target. It did have one or two industrial targets. Um, the main reason, though, as he himself admitted in his post-war book, was that it would burn very well. On March the 28th, over 200 bombers attacked Lübeck. The fires took 32 hours to put out. More than 300 people died. Hitler was furious and promised Churchill revenge. Möge dieser Mann nicht wieder klar und wimmer, wenn ich mich nun gezwungen sehen werde, eine Antwort zu geben, die sehr viel Leid über sein eigenes Volk hat. Ich werde von jetzt ab wieder Schlag um Schlag vergelten, bis dieser Verbrecher fällt und sein Werk zerbricht. When that revenge came a month later, York's defences were undeniably poor. The city had neither barrage balloons nor anti-aircraft guns to stave off attacks. London had the also in London, there were lots of these barrage balloons in the sky, but York didn't have any. I don't remember any defences at all. There was nothing. We were able to fly in, drop the bombs and go home, if there were no night fighters. The people of York had felt vulnerable and exposed that night as the bombers flew over. In some quarters, the finger was pointed at the RAF. They were just hovering over the houses and over the buildings. There, there was no, uh, nothing to stop them. There wasn't any fighters up then. Secret RAF records released after the war show the night fighter squadrons were scrambled 25 minutes after the raid began, but this apparently was normal practice. They would like to wait until the bombers got over the target because uh, the method is that once you've got the fires, you can see the German bomber. So um, it, there could have been a delay due to that, but other than that, we'd been standing by all evening, so there's no reason to delay it anymore. The squadron were proud of their record that night. From our point of view, it was very successful, yes, to shoot down four. Personally, I had friends in York, and uh, I was very glad that we were able to do what we did. At the Bar Convent, the nuns tried to find something positive amid the devastation. I don't think there was any bitterness at all. It was this great act of charity, really, that brought about this tragedy. Any loss of life is sad, and to lose five members out of the community was a terrible thing. The five nuns who died are now buried in a peaceful cemetery in the convent grounds. I mean, the charity that it engendered among everybody and that feeling of everybody being together and suffering together and so on, all those were positive things, which I think the war produced everywhere. And it brought us so close to the children that it was something tangible. Brenda Milner's father was posthumously awarded the King's Commendation for Brave Conduct. To this day, a plaque in his memory stands at York Station. Well, all sorts of things happen in life, don't they, that uh, give you a different path. You just don't know what it would have been like if he'd been alive, uh, possibly different, but uh, uh, we shall never know. Freiburg in southern Germany. This town is now home to Dr. Karl Merlin. He returned here after spending the remainder of the war as a POW. What did I feel when I was dropping the bombs? I knew that women and children and men would be hit and die. 
But we were just soldiers and didn't think about that. I only thought about these things later, when I was in a prison camp. Only then did I realize what I'd done with my bombs, killed people who I didn't know, whom I had nothing against. 79 people died in the raid, more than 200 were injured. Thousands of buildings were destroyed. York was a retaliatory attack by Hitler after the British bombing of Lübeck. Despite the Führer's worst intentions, many of York's most famous landmarks remained intact. But one of York's best-known churches, St. Martin Le Grand, was almost completely destroyed in the raid. Today it is partially restored with contributions from the German government. With its fire-blackened stonework and stained-glass windows, it is a lasting symbol of post-war peace. Well, I think it just catches the, the atmosphere at the time of the fire and the turmoil and so on that was going on in the city. Uh, um, I'm sure of fear as well. A single memorial marks the terrible events of April the 29th, 1942. So simple, isn't it, I think? Uh, um, the words of Jesus uh, as they were nailing him to the cross, you know, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. Father, forgive. It's just so simple and straightforward. Everyone can, uh, I think, uh, associate themselves with that. Edna Blakeborough suffered severe head injuries in the raid and took years to recover. I lost my youth. I would be about 42 when I knew what it was to feel really well and to be able to do normal things and enjoy life. After the war, Nunthorpe Grove was rebuilt and the Blakeboroughs moved back in. You've got to start again. And we were fortunate. There were so many families killed and so many left with just perhaps a mother or a father. We were a family. There was Frank, myself and Anne. So we could start again, couldn't we? And that was more than a lot could. The Luftwaffe never revisited York with any real force for the rest of the war. Apart from the war memorial, there is little sign in York today that they were ever here at all. Little to show for the night that ordinary people did extraordinary things.